Don't know how I lost us there, but there we are. We're back. Let us pray together. Father, it's in the precious name of Jesus. I thank you for your loving kindnesses, the great multitude of your tender mercies. Thank you that this day was a great day because you made it and you made us to rejoice in it. I thank you that, Father, that everything that concerns me, everything that concerns us, Father, you are perfecting it even now because you are for us. No matter what happens in our lives, you are for us. Thank you, Father, as we study your word. I pray now for wisdom and direction. And I pray that you would direct us and keep us from the spirit of error. In Jesus' name, I ask and I pray. Amen and amen. Well, I thank God for another opportunity to come and share this word with you. I just love it. Praise God. Thank God for the word. I'm trying to get my lighting right. Okay. I can't move because it'll get darker. And uh, maybe it's just me. It looks dark to me. All right. Well, I want to continue in part where I left off last week in um, uh, talking about Christ being with us, Christ being um, being in Christ, putting on Christ. So I want to talk tonight about Christ being all or Christ being everything to us. I know that we are. Uh, well, OK, let me start here. Man is a three part being mind, body and soul. And a lot of times we put more emphasis on the soul part, which is the emotional part, the natural part. We put more emphasis there than we do on the spiritual part. And we have to understand that being in Christ means that we are moving, migrating toward the spiritual and away from the, the soulish or the flesh. Yes, we live in this flesh. And so we must do the things that's required to live. We got to eat, drink, sleep, get our vitamins, eat vegetables. Yes, you must eat vegetables. We have to do all of those things because it is beneficial to the shell that we are in. And there's nothing wrong with that. But also, we must feed the spirit, man. We must increase in Christ must increase in the spirit and you have to ask yourself this question on a daily basis am I giving glory to God is my life giving him glory am I growing in him not satisfying me but am I satisfying him not to impress anybody else but to satisfy him not to make myself look good to anybody else because guess what I'm just not you know I'm not up to it I, I'm just never going to live up to I am um, I told my classes this today that I had made an error in um, a statement that I had made. And then it sounded wrong, but um, in my studying and preparing for class, I don't know, I, I crossed up a couple of things and um, my head was saying, no, that's wrong. My mouth kept saying it's right. And um, so I went to them and I apologized to them. So I know that I'm not perfect, but in my spirit, man, I should be growing. I should have a thirst for God. I should have a thirst for righteousness. I should have a thirst for knowing more of him. And so Christ being in us, us being in Christ, us putting on Christ means that we are trying to be like him. And we got to be honest. We have to, we got to be honest. And we have to chastise ourselves this is not a, a testimony to to um uh to build ourselves up or to make us look good but we got to chastise ourselves and say listen self get in line with the word of god all right and that's why we're studying the word of god because we want to be just like him all right y'all forgive me i'm in a new spot and um this lighting is just not pleasing me at all i don't know why it's doing that okay all right, let's look at the book of Colossians. We had a wonderful time on Sunday. If you missed Sunday, please go to YouTube, um, scroll through Facebook, find that message. Uh, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And I didn't even, I didn't even scratch the surface. According to the power that worketh in us, that's what the scripture says. He's able to do that. He will do that. Excuse me for reaching. Mm, hello. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above what we ask 
or think exceeding, we keep saying exceedingly, exceeding, doesn't matter, exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think. And uh, uh, above, exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. There must be some power working in us. This is um doing that, jumping. All right. But it was a time that we were refreshed by God. And we need that. We need that. If we are not getting that flow, that we're not getting that, we're not growing. We're going to become stagnant. All right. Let me hurry up. All right. Colossians chapter three. And I'm going to start at verse 11. It says where there is neither Jew, uh, Greek nor Jew, nor circumcision, nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. But Christ is all. And in all, and I touched on this a little bit last week, but the goal is to have Christ in everybody. And we do things that are denominational driven, man driven, self driven, and we isolate people. Somebody said to me uh, this weekend, they were going to a church and um, they told them they have to start wearing, you know, dress in a particular way to come to church. And that person was like, why can't I do that? And um, so we have we have placed our own uh, ideas of holiness in front of God accepting us and being in us. We put restrictions. Women can't do this and women can't do that. And and uh, we were growing up. We couldn't go to the football game, the basketball game, couldn't go skating, the bowling, any of those things. We put those restrictions. But the goal here, according to the scripture, is to be uh, in Christ or let Christ be in us so that there's no distinction. I, I know that, that, that men and women are different, but in Christ, we should be the same. And some people are saying, you know, I know that there are some places that have women bishops and some places saying, no, no, no women bishops. The Bible said the bishop is a husband of one man. Okay. And I mean, we can debate that. So is it the husband of one man or can it be the wife of one husband to be the bishop? Do you think God is God? I don't think that the Lord is um, having a fit over that. I think only we're having to fit, not him. All right. But if he calls someone, who are we to say what he can do with his creation? So Paul here says that, um, in verse 10, having put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. He didn't create anything. Jew, Greek, he didn't create those. He created man and he created woman. All right. So we're all free in him. Verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. And I can't see. We have to understand the context of the Bible. I was listening to uh, Bishop Jakes and he was preaching from. Uh, Genesis 6, talking about Noah and the flood. And he really kind of touched on pre-flood and post-flood, all right, or pre-flood and during flood, all right? And he said some things, and then I thought about that as I was listening to him. Do you know that what we get in the Bible, the flood didn't happen in three verses. The, bl the flood didn't happen in a chapter. It took, I believe, a hundred years for God to send that water to flood the earth. A hundred years. And a lot of things went on in that hundred years. We don't know everything that went on. We don't know all that they did. So when we read the scriptures, we must be, uh, we must pray for the revelation that comes from God. The revelation that comes through the Holy Spirit, because we don't get the whole picture. We get a fraction of. So Paul wrote this letter. Why did he write the letter? Was he responding to something? Was he setting something in order? What was he doing? We don't know. We know what the portion that we have is good. Yes, the portion we have is great. But what prompted him to write this? Was it the, the unction of the Holy Ghost or was it a, a response to an issue? 
Don't know. All right. We don't know at all. But this he says, you are the elect of God, men and women, holy and beloved. He says, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Now, this is being in Christ. When Christ is all, this is who he is. We imitate him. All right. Uh, the literal translation says, therefore, as elect ones of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Hmm? Kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Now, I want to be like Jesus. And and <laughs> we sing we sing that song, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. But when we look at what Christ went through, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to love like he loved? Are we willing to deal with people as he dealt with people? Are we willing to love people as he loved people? If we're not, then you need to check yourself. Not, not your salvation. Salvation is pure. Salvation is complete and it's whole. But you got to check yourself and ask you, how am I living for God? All right? Ask yourself that question. All right, so he says now, these are the characteristics that a Christian exemplifies. The compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And, and I know that some relationships are tough, especially between parents and children. Some of those things are tough. And it's hard to find some compassion sometimes or kindness for someone because they keep doing the same things. And that's our story. You keep doing the same thing. So why am I going to forgive you? Why would I trust you? Because you keep doing the same thing. That's difficult, yes. But we got to pray and ask God to help us to exemplify these characteristics if we want to be like Christ. And here's a question that you must ask, all right? The question is not, am I going to get to heaven? The question is, how am I representing while I'm here? So, if I if I don't reconcile with somebody, you know, yeah, you should reconcile with your brother and you should love your brother. But let's say that I fall out with somebody and for whatever reason, we don't get an opportunity to say I'm sorry to each other or forgive each other. Will I not make it to heaven? I, I, I don't think that's going to keep me out. But the question is, what am I representing while I'm here? This is the thing that's important. While I'm here, what am I representing? My salvation, my eternal life, the eternal power, the eternal presence of God has already been guaranteed. I can't do anything about that. I can't stop that because it is a gift. But how are you representing while you're here? Now, and I had to come to the realization that I'm human and that I do love people. I love in spite of, but there are some, there are some wounds that really, you know, get at me. And there are some things that I just found myself wanting to forgive, but I just didn't quite forgive. Um, I think I made a statement um, concerning um, after the, the last shooting when the young man shot and killed those kids and, and, and the, um, the teachers. And he himself was killed. But, you know, I made the statement in all honesty, Lord, you got to forgive him because I can't. I don't have that capacity right now. I'm too hurt. I want to forgive him. Will I pray for him? Certainly. You know, if he was alive, I would pray for him. But I'm like, Lord, I, I have to love him from a distance. And so I'm just asking the Lord to help me because I'm not him yet, but I'm becoming him. And so in the situations arise, how do I show, exemplify Christ? All right, let's move on. All right. You want to be a Christian? You want to name the name of Christ? He says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Ooh. Forbearing. All right. Uh, and the, the, the Greek here means to hold oneself up against. That is, put up with. Hold yourself up. All right, this is cussing time, but I'm going to hold that cussing because I'm going to forbear. I'm going to put up with you. I should cuss you out from A to Z, but I'm going to put up with you. I have a friend that I talk to on a regular basis who just rubs me the wrong way all the time. You say, well, why do you keep talking to him? Because I'm forbearing. I'm putting up with him. 
And I realized it's his character. Just to say stuff. He may mean harm. I don't think he, well, I know he doesn't mean any harm. It's just the way he talks. And um, sometimes it just it just bothers me. But I realize that the the conversation or the words don't have the intent. They don't they don't reach a target. And I just wish sometimes the conversation would just move up a notch on the intellectual level. But anyway, we put up with each other. We need to put up with each other at home. We need to put up with each other in worship. We need to put up with each other on our jobs, forbearing one another in love. How difficult it is. It can be at times. But we are called, we are called to suffer and to endure and to show forth his praises, show forth his life, his, uh, what, did he, what did he die for? Who did he die for? We are to show that until he comes back. All right. So forbearing, putting up with one another and forgiving. Have forgiveness one toward another. And this is so crucial in the house of God, with the people of God. How are you going to shout on the left side of the church and not speak to people on the right side of the church? And I watched people when I was growing up. I watched them have so many isms and schisms. Um, I shouldn't say it that way. But there were times that I heard people talking and they were upset about something. And um, there was certainly some coldness between, uh, you know, sometimes some of the members. They didn't stop speaking and, you know, th that I could tell. They were cordial. And sometimes I, I saw that they avoided each other. But we've got to learn how to forgive. And sometimes your forgiveness has to exceed the person's capacity to be sorry about what they did. Let me say that again. Sometimes our forgiveness has to exceed the person who wronged us. It has to exceed their ability to ask for forgiveness. Because guess who did it first? His name is Jesus. Forgave way beyond we were able to accept. So he did it before we asked for it. It was in place. And I mean, I mean, I grew up in church. I don't know that I would have found the Lord or been a faithful church member or, you know, seeking God. I don't know that that would have been my life if I had not grown up in it. I don't know that. But I do know this, that uh, my willingness to say, Lord, forgive me because I'm a sinner was far short of the forgiveness that he gave. And anybody that tells you that they were on par with God's forgiveness, they're lying because he has more grace than you have sin. I'm glad about that. And I watch people live lives. There's this one guy, I'm grateful that he, uh, when I, I always see him in church at a particular church that I visit, but his excuse is, well, I'm not ready yet, but he comes to church faithfully. So I'm, I'm hoping that somewhere in there he talks to Jesus <laughs> because I would hate for him. He would hate to have been in church faithfully all this time and not have Jesus as his Lord and Savior, not put on Christ, not allow Christ to dwell in him. That would be tragic. And may I say this to you, and I probably this is probably not for you, but it's for somebody else. People that say, well, when I, I'm going to come when I get ready. I don't want to backslide. I don't want to, uh, I don't know, let God down or some stuff they say. Let me tell you something. You'll never be ready. And you're going to always disappoint God. Well, I shouldn't say that. But you, you'll never be ready. And there's always the possibility that any of us will disappoint God. I was just thinking today that um, I remember I was in a service. And I felt the draw to go and pray for a man. And um, I was like, Lord, this man ain't going to receive that. And I didn't. And actually, I looked for him and he was gone. He had moved. And so he told me after service, I said, if you real, you'll call me and blah, blah, blah. All right. Listen, don't take them chances. If God's got something for you, say, Lord, I receive it. Whatever. He, if he call me or not, I receive it. And um he died shortly thereafter. Uh, just, you know, I don't, he wasn't sick or anything. 
that I knew of. I think he just had a heart attack and died, or maybe he just went to sleep and just died. It was like out of a sudden, it was out of the blue, but it was like really unexpected. And um, not that that impacted him living or dying, but I felt I disappointed God because I felt the Lord pulling me to go and pray for him. So now what do I do? Do I just quit? No, I said, Lord, help me, help me to be responsive to, to your voice and to move when you say move. Okay. So he has the capacity to forgive us far beyond our desire and our ability to repent for our sin. Hello. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. If we sin, we have an advocate. Imagine that. If I commit sin, if I fall, if I trip, if I do it deliberately, he's already praying for me saying, Father, forgive him. Now, that's that's what I talk, call exceeding abundantly above. Hello, somebody. Y'all ain't going to help me. All right. So forgiving us, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So we, you know, we hear that all the time. Your brother has an art against you. Go to your brother and ask for forgiveness. And sometimes people are going to say, no, I don't forgive you. And Jesus says, you don't have a problem with them, but if you think they have a problem, if you just think they do, you think they have a problem, then go and be reconciled. Because listen, this is this is a true picture of Christ going and being reconciled to your brother. Because guess what? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it was God in Christ reconciling us to him. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry to go and to grab those who are lost, to grab those brothers, to those who walked away, it is our job to go and get them and bring them back. And I must say that I don't see much in this day and age where we are actively witnessing. They used to do street services. I was always embarrassed to be on the street. I did it. I was like, I just felt nervous. You know, I, oh. Even in other cities, when um, I would go and help other people, we would, we would go into the street. I'm like, ooh, I just like the comfort of the church. But I can't be like Christ and be comfortable in those four walls. I need to get out and compel people. Listen, I don't have to be on the street corner with a bullhorn. You go to Jesus, you're going to hell. I don't have to do that. But. We can gather and worship and sing and pray and tell people, hey, how you doing? We love you. Jesus loves you. We can do that. We can be unobtrusive and non-obnoxious and witness to people. I remember a church in um, Orlando uh, that was, they were doing witnessing. And um, I don't know, I happened by there or something like that, whatever it was. But I encountered one of their members and they were so pleasant. When they, you know, I don't know what they asked me, whatever it was, you know, they ultimately asked me if I was saved or whatever. Here, come visit our church. It was so pleasant. It was so beautiful. And um, I just never had the opportunity to just to go to that church and tell them how much I appreciate the work they were doing. And um, if I ever win the lottery after I play, I don't play yet. But whatever surplus I get, I want to bless them. And now since I said it, I'm going to, have to do it anyway. Uh, I don't have a surplus, but I am going to give them something. So I'll make my way. Um, let me take a Sunday off on my vacation and go visit them. Because they were, they, was, they were doing the work of Christ and they were doing it in such a pleasant way. It was so beautiful. It really was. It was so sweet. And I don't know who it was, if that person is still there. I, I don't know. But we need to be concerned about those who are not saved in our community. Uh, and maybe this commentary is, is misplaced, but it's sad that people are so comfortable clubbing and smoking and drinking around saints and around the church. They, they may still give reverence to the grounds, but where the property line ends, they're right there smoking and drinking and cussing and carrying on, coming in the church now, cussing people out. They come to church and, and not that dress really matters, but 
they still come dressed like they go into the club. I, I wish they would dress. Listen, if they come, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you dress. Come on. If you don't have on enough, we'll help you cover up a little bit. But just come, just come, just come. But I do wish that we <laughs> would have a little more respect. Hey, Lorenzo, my classmate, how you been? Um, but I appreciate or we need to appreciate the fact that we got to reach out to people who don't know Jesus or people who know Jesus, but they're in a state of disfellowship. They need to be reconciled. All right. Um, verse 13, again, if you have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, just be his, let him be your example. You forgive also. Verse 14, and above all things, all these things, Put on charity. Put on love. Watch this. Which is the bond of, perf of perfectness. I was going to say perfectness. Perfectness. It is the hook, the joint, the tie that binds. It's like a ligament. All right. My fingers move because of ligaments. If, you, if I sever the ligaments, my fingers won't move. He says, if you really want to be like Christ, if you want to be in Christ and Christ to be in you, then you've got to put on love because it ties us, it bonds us to each other and to him. It is the bond of perfectness. Perfectness, perfect means to complete, to mature. When you learn how to love, you have reached a level of maturity in Christ that not many people get to. I listen to some of the saints now and the things that they say. And, and, and not, this is the sad part. They're not being vicious. They're not attacking somebody else. They're not hating somebody else. But there's, there is an evidence of a lack of love because they they uh they talk about the people's faults or uh, another person's faults oh well you know she don't do this and she that and other thing but i say and i learned this a long time ago don't come to me to tell me about somebody else don't make me your garbage can okay let's pray for them um I'm going to pick on Kurt Franklin and remember when his son recorded a conversation and Kurt was using those Sunday school words that y'all use. Mm -hmm. And somebody said to me, don't you think he owes the church an apology? I said, no, he does not owe anybody an apology. Number one, if you got children, I understand why you cuss. Okay. You don't have to, but I understand why you do. But I said, no, he doesn't owe us anything because he did not offend us. He did not wrong us. And it just simply proves that Kurt Franklin is still flesh and blood, still alive. Still got some oops in his life and, and nothing he said was going to cause him to miss heaven. We were just shocked because it was broadcast. And some of y'all use that language on a regular basis anyway. And I said, if I was close to Kirk, I'd call Kirk and say, Kirk, you busy Sunday morning? Come on by, son, and minister. It doesn't, because he's used some language that you don't use at church, but you cuss your, your husband out all the time. That's the bond of perfectness. The bond of maturity says, well, let's throw our arms around him. Don't sit back and judge him and and fold your arms. Well, Kirk, when you um when you apologize, we'll buy another another CD. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And it's petty. It's it's small. When there are people hungry, hello. There are people who need uh, shelter. And I'm worried about Kirk using some profanity at his son because they were angry. Come on, people. Come on. Love. 
It is the bond. It's the tie that says we have reached perfection in Christ. Not to be better than anybody else, but we've just reached that perfection in him. Verse 15. Now, I could talk about this for another 30 minutes. And let the peace of God. Hmm? Here's our issue. Some people, you just don't have peace. When you have peace, a lot of this stuff just will not bother you. It just will not. It's not going to phase you at all. I got to work early this morning because I need to make um, quite a bit of copies for my kids. So I said, I'm going to go early so I can get out of everybody's way. And I ended up tying up two copy machines. We have three in the teacher's work room. I, was, I tied up two of the copying machines. And um, in my defense, let me defend myself. All right. I started with one copy machine and the, uh, the paper got jammed or something like that. So I moved to another copier. And um, when I cleared the paper jam, it just started printing the stuff that I had sent through already. So I said, I might as well just let it run. And so I said to a couple of teachers that were standing there waiting to make copies. And I said, I'm so sorry. She said, no worries. She said, first come, first serve. And they were just like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to get upset about this little thing. And that just, that should parlay into every part of our lives. Let the peace of God rule so that your husband saying something or not saying something doesn't make you go from zero to 200. Or your kids not responding. Don't let it go to, to zero, zero to 200. They're going to try you. The devil's going to try you and find ways, find ways to handle that other than your, your temperature going up, your stress level going up. I took a class this summer and, um, these are words that uh, probably offend most teachers. All right. So if a child fails a class, and gets a low grade, do, doesn't do well on the state test. The principal was asking, well, what did you do? And I used to sing this song. Um, what the kids got to do. They take on responsibility. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, all that's true. That is true. But I asked myself this question, what did I do as a teacher to help these children? So I took a class this summer and the aim was to change the behavior, get this, of the teacher, not the kids. So if the children come late to class, am I gonna jump in down? Don't come to my class late, where's your pass? Go back run. If they're talking at the wrong time, you stop talking. I'm tired of something. Is that my behavior? If they're not following directions, what am I doing? So the aim was to teach us to change our behavior in response to their behavior. And that is so wonderful. That is so factual. That is so needful in the body of Christ, in the house of God. Change your behavior in response to somebody else's behavior. I said this, the Lord just revealed this to me, I guess. Um, and I'm going to say it again. When I was growing up, the church folk did everything they were supposed to do to make me quit. I was supposed to quit. I was, I was never supposed to do this. I was never supposed to come this far. They lied enough. They laughed enough. They set traps for me enough. They did all of those things. Lied on, cheated, talked about mistreated, buke scorn, um, talked about Shirley going up, down, almost level to the ground. I had all of that, all of that. And I should have quit. And I and I just realized that, you know, recently, I'm like, why did I quit? Because Christ was in me and he was pulling me through it. I cried, I was angry. Um, I did my best not to talk about people and tear people down. That was never my thing. But um, I was definitely hurt. I avoided some people. I quit. Now, I did quit church. Let me let me be honest. I quit. I ain't going back no more. I'm sick of church. I said, Lord, I'm not mad with you, but I'm just not going back. And so, I mean, baby, I went full Monty. 
and I missed one Sunday of church, didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to church today. And I, I uh, <laughs> that's right. As long as I got King Jesus, Dr. Donald's, um, I lay there in the bed. I'm not getting up, not going to Sunday school, not going to church. And I woke up. I said, "Ooh, it's about two or three in the afternoon. I think it was like a quarter to 10. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? So I missed one Sunday and I couldn't take it. I could not take not being in church. So my whole rebellion lasted for a week, y'all. So somebody please come and encourage me, you know. But I had to learn. I I was more forgiving than what was done to me. And God was God was gracious. He sent people to minister to me. And I didn't even know I was being ministered to. But he loved me so much that he kept pulling me. He protected me. He blinded my eyes to some things. Um, listen, some wounds hurt deeply, deeply. And I still have not gotten an apology yet from some people, but it's okay. I'm trying to see if anybody's died. I don't know. But I thank God because that bond of perfectness, that love that forgives, it kept me. It kept me. It really did. All right. I'm sorry. I was talking about the peace of God, wasn't I? So now the peace of God, it keeps you from them from rattling your cage. It keeps you from losing it. It keeps you from walking away. It keeps you from being like them. So whatever is said, whatever is done, my response because of them is different. So I'm not going to scream because they're screaming. I'm not going to yell because they yell. I'm not going to fall out because they fall out. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to be mad because they're mad. Get out my face. Okay, I'll talk to them. Sorry. And move on. Love them. And the next time I see them, if they want to speak, then I'll speak. If they don't want to speak, I won't bother them. But I'm not going to sit around and hold a grudge. All right. So let God's peace rule in your hearts. Now, you talk about this, just show us. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Because talking about it means that you're trying to cover up a weak spot. I'm not saying that to judge you, but I'm saying you're not talk about it. Just be it. Just do it. And it's not that I'm doing this because somebody's watching me. I'm doing this because it's who I am. I want to be like Christ. Miss Stockton, good evening. You're late for church, but we'll talk about that later. All right. I, mean, I want to be like him. So I have to allow him. All right. If it's his peace that's ruling, that's just like his might, his strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So it's his peace that's ruling. And if his peace is ruling in me, guess what? My faith is going to be rock solid. I'm not going to have any issues with that. Okay. Um, it says you are called to that. We're called to one body and be thankful that we're in this body. If you don't get your act together, I can never be what God called me to be. I'm going to be struggling to fulfill my destiny because you won't get in place. And if you're hanging around and pulling me down and pull other people down, we can't reach our destiny. I might have been a millionaire if some people had gotten in place, but they were out of place. They were out of step. So some things I missed, but I guarantee you this, and I'm, I'm telling you this from, from experience, God made up for what people did not do. Remember that scripture? And we say it all the time, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Well, well, God calls men to give into your bosom. God calls some men to come and bless me in places and things, not just money, but cause me to recover what the canker worm had eaten. If I wasn't sitting in this chair, I'd get up and run right now. He caused a harvest to come. Because some other people were not in place. So I'm telling you, get in your place so you can push people to where they need to be so they can pull you 
where you need to go. Because if you're in place, God is not going to bless them without blessing you. But if you're out of place, they'll be blessed. But you won't be. Think about uh, Naomi or Ruth. I always get them confused. Look at Ruth. Ruth, who Boaz said, um, leave some extra for her. Hmm? When he says, he told his people, when you go to gather your grain, leave some choice pieces for her. So now get this. If they had not been in place, I might have to preach that. If they didn't weren't in place to leave the choice pieces when Naomi came along, she would have had nothing to glean. And if Naomi had not been in place at the right time, Boaz never would have seen her. Y'all better get this. This part here is just that I done went off to the deep end now. Naomi had to do what she was supposed to do, be where she was supposed to be. So Boaz could notice her. And so Boaz said to the people who were in front of her, leave for her. So I'm telling you, if you don't get in your proper place and allow God to develop your gifts and your talents and your callings, if you don't do that, then you are hindering somebody else at the top and at the bottom. I don't think you'll stop them from getting it completely, but you will slow it down. Hmm? So listen, in this season, I'm just going to, have to be a little raw with you. So all y'all hollering about, I can't talk in front of people and the Lord is calling you. Oh, I can't teach and the Lord is calling you. Oh, I'm just, I'm nervous about getting singing in front of people and the Lord is calling you. You're out of place and you're causing a disruption in the body. And I am I am thirsty right now to have a and I'm I'm going to establish this. I'm going to have this. I am thirsty to have a men's class because I need to teach these men how to be men. And ladies, y'all don't need to know what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to talk down to the the the, the dirt flow. Because the men are not being men. Anyway, and I'll get somebody to talk to the ladies about being, and I might have to talk to the ladies too about being ladies. Jake said it well. We are raising women to be men. Because you got in your head, some women, that, oh, I'm independent. I don't need no man. And so guess what? You never get one. Because you keep saying, I don't need one. And then you're mad when the one that comes along is not doing what you would do because you've taken his place. I'm all off kilter there. Let me get right. Somebody type in there, shut up, Pastor. Come on, type it in there. Pastor, shut up. All right. Be thankful. Don't you type that in there. Be thankful. All right. This should be your attitude. Be thankful. Listen, it's going to get rough, but it's not that rough. Be thankful. Don't be like people. I, I said to a student today, she said, oh, you know, the sun don't ever shine in my life. I said, how many, how many hands you got? I got two. Are they broken? Yeah, they broken. I said, what about your feet? <laughs> I said, your feet broken? Yeah, they broken. My feet hurt. And I said, so in other words, you're just not going to be happy about anything. You got hands that you could use. You're not crippled. Your fingers are not like this. Your hand is not closed up. You can use your hands, but you're more focused on that. I'm not saying they're not that they're trivial. I'm not saying that, that, that help is not needed or whatever, but you are focusing on the negative things of life instead of praising God for the positive things that you have. Oh, I ain't got no gas for my car. Well, praise God, you can still walk. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. Oh, baby, do I? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. If you are thankful, it opens the flow. It opens the exceeding abundantly above. It opens the supply to supply to supply. Do you want God to supply? He does not supply where you're complaining. He does not supply where you're griping. He does not supply where you're angry. 
But when you are in unity with him and the peace of God is ruling, not just to make you sit by and say, oh, don't worry about it. No, he says, you sit and be still and allow me to work in your life. That's why you need the peace. All right. I got to get out of here. All right. Verse 18 or uh, 16. Let the word of Christ and I'm going to stop dwell richly or dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Hmm. Jesus said, if my word abide in you, and you and me, you can ask what you will. Because guess what? Me abiding in him equates to me being in the father. Because Jesus said, I and my father are one. I am in the father. And so now I'm in you. The Holy Ghost is in you. So everything the father has is at your disposal. But you got to let him be in control. His peace has to rule. His love has to rule. His wisdom has to rule. And guess what? All the things you're complaining about, they now are effortless because the father supplies all of your need. And this is where I'm trying to get us to go greater. It's not focusing on the thing you think you need God to supply. But I want you to relax in God so that God gives you the things that you never even thought about. Now unto him, Ephesians 3 and 20, I believe, now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly, all right? He exceeds abundantly not exceed abundance, exceeds abundantly above all you can ask or think. Let me give you a picture of what I mean. Y'all know what a thimble is? Y'all remember the thimbles that grandma used to have, mom used to have, put on your finger when they were sewing that little thimble, okay, about that big? What he's saying is, you're the thimble, I'm the ocean. How many times or how long would it take for you to drain the ocean with a thimble? Think about that. Do you think you'd ever run out of ocean water? With a thimble. <laughs> Do you ever think you get tired of dipping? Do you think the ocean would give out before you wear out? God says, that's who I am. I am able to. To do, exceed, to do, this is active, to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Mount Everest is 7,000 odd feet, 7,000, 7,340 something. It's 7,000 plus feet high. Mount Everest, you know, Mount Everest, the tallest mountain second tallest mountain in the world. And yet there are mountains under the sea taller than Mount Everest. So God says, whatever you see, I got one greater. That's what I want us to be. We are just piddling around, asking God for these little things and trusting God and falling out over little things that God can supply. I've learned this. Stop grasping for stuff that God is trying to take away from you. Let him take it because he wants to give you something better. Oh, my gosh. I'm at 49 minutes. Let the word dwell in you richly. Let what the word says, because the word is alive. The word is life. The word is, is water for washing. The word is everything. Let it dwell in you richly. How many of y'all know the 23rd Psalm? Lord, my shepherd shall not want. Make him lie down, bring back to That's all you know. How many out of the 24th Psalms? <gasps> oh. I, mm. How many know Matthew chapter 12? Or Deuteronomy chapter 28? And I'm not saying just be able to quote scriptures, but I'm saying read them, 
ingest them, digest them, thirst for them. I want to be him. He's everything. He is everything. Without him, I'm nothing. And when you go through the rough times, then you have the rest of us to lean on. Because while you're going through, we're rejoicing because we just came out. So if you can't really praise him like you should or want to, you make sure you connect with us so we can hold you up forbearing one another, putting up with one another. You crying and moping and carrying on, we're going to put up with it because we're going to all praise him together. Hmm? Well, God bless you. I love you all. Thank you so much. I'm seeing people, I'm seeing in the comments, people I have not seen in a while, and I'm so glad to see you. Bishop, we was on the line. Uh, Sister May Pinkney is in all the time. Auntie May May. This is Sherry, Keisha. Thank you so much for all of you that are tuning in and supporting me and encouraging me to sit here and talk while you listen. Listen, anytime you want to come on screen, let me know you're welcome to give us your input. It's not, I don't mean for you to listen to me the whole time. All right. But I love you all and I thank you so much. Y'all pray for me and I pray for you. I will see you on Sunday. The Lord bless you and keep you. Is my prayer. I will see you then.